Hi, my name is Becky Robinson, and I am so thrilled to be here today with Nate Regier for this great webinar conference isn't the problem and I'm thrilled that so many of you have decided to join us today. You know before the recording began Nate and I were chatting a little bit about the fact that we've seen that there are many of you within organizations who have chosen today to gather to learn together and if you're in an organization who's doing that if you're all gathered in a conference room would you give that a shout out in the question panel tell us the name of your organization and where you're located so that we can welcome you um, and actually I see one already Kim is um, here with nine staff watching at PRN. I'm not sure what that stands for. Do you know, Nate? I do. Welcome, Kim. So thank you so much. If you're not with the group, but you're you're solo, um, I also love to hear that as well. And you can let us know where you're calling in from. Quite often, we have audiences from around the world who join us to learn together. And we're so thrilled for this opportunity. So it looks like we have a lot of people representing from the state of Kansas. And yeah. uh, that's because that's where Nate is based, um, and Hutchinson, Hutchinson Community College in Newton Center in Newton, Kansas, uh, there's a group there. And we've got um, a group of nine from the Hospice of Davidson County in North Carolina. Welcome to all of you, um, and several of you from across the country. And uh, I don't know that I see any um, around the world folks yet. Oh, someone from the UK. Welcome, Tony. So thank you so much for all of you who are choosing to learn with us today. I have a few housekeeping items as we begin to help you get the most out of this event. Uh, the first thing is you might notice at the bottom of Nate's slides he has at next Nate. That's his Twitter handle. And we would love to have you tweet live and share your learning throughout this event. If you do so, please use the hashtag Conflict Without Casualties, which happens to be the name of Nate's book, which is available currently in a limited edition hardcover. So we hope that you will um, check that out and we'll tell you more about the book later in this broadcast. You might also be interested in the slides from today's event and we will be sharing the slides as a PDF in an email follow-up that you'll receive from me today along with a link to the recording of this session so you can continue to learn or share it with someone else who might benefit from the learning. Um, we also have a very special offer at the end of this webinar for a chance for you to learn even more from Nate in a free setting. And so I hope that you'll stay on the broadcast through the Q&A that we're going to leave time for at the end until the very end so you can hear about the special offer of advanced learning free with Dr. Nate Regier. So I think I've covered all the basic housekeeping items. If you have any questions, you can put them in the question panel for me throughout the event and I'm going to take a moment to introduce Nate and then I'm going to go away so that we can all have the chance to learn from Nate today. Uh, so I first met Nate this summer at the ATD conference in Denver. I don't know if any of you were there and I remember walking around the corner Nate's booth and his team at Next Element were off on the side and Nate was doing this presentation and walking around this amazing uh, leading out of drama model and I was absolutely captivated by Nate and his presentation. So it's a real thrill to be able to support his work now. Uh, a little bit about Nate. He is one of the co-founding owners of Next Element which is a global advisory firm specializing in building cultures of ac compassionate accountability. And Nate's going to teach us more about what that means. He's also a former practicing psychologist, and he's certified as a leading out of drama master trainer and a certifying master trainer for the process communication model. Nate and his team are absolutely amazing to work with, and I've enjoyed getting to know Nate. I think we'll get to know him on this call. Uh, you might be curious to know that he's married to Julie, who's a part of the Next Element team and has three beautiful daughters. So we are the parents of daughters who are collaborating today because I have three daughters as well. So Nate, thank you so much for choosing to invest your time in, in teaching and learning with us today. Thank you so much, Becky. It's great to be here and welcome everyone. Looking through the list from people around the country and around the world, it's, uh, it's like we're a big community today. And uh, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you so much, Becky, for helping put this together and for your wonderful support as we take this message of compassion and accountability to a larger audience. Well, um, as Becky mentioned, I have three daughters, and these are a picture of my girls. And I'll have to tell you, today's a very special day for me. The shirt that I'm wearing, actually, if I stand up a little bit, you can see that it has the word Newton on it. Tonight is senior night for my middle daughter, Emily, who's on the left of your screen there. She's graduating tonight, and tonight is her very last volleyball game. 
So it's a very big day for me. In addition to this uh, webinar, I also get to go enjoy that and have some bittersweet goodbyes and also welcoming her to the next stage of her life. However, it's not been so great all the way along the way. And I'll tell you, I don't know about the rest of you, but if anybody has kids out there, you might relate to this story. Today we're going to talk a little bit about drama and about how to do conflict in healthy ways. And I want to set the stage by sharing a story that occurred with my oldest daughter, Lauren, who is on the right side of your screen there. So our girls all have cell phones, and if you have children, you probably understand the whole relationship with cell phones. And, and uh, one of the rules that we have in our house is that uh, each person is only allowed to do 2,000 texts per month. Now that's kind of an old rule that we set a while back when texts were still popular. But this occurred a while back in uh, about four or five years ago. My oldest daughter was a, a sophomore, I believe, in high school. She was dating someone on the football team, and it was Friday night in fall in Kansas, and there's nothing better in the Midwest than Friday night football. Well, I came home from work and uh, thought I would go ahead and check the, uh, our Sprint account to see how many texts she had used. And it was about 5 o'clock on this Friday afternoon, and I noticed that she had 2,004 texts. So I did what any good dad would do, right? I went to lay down the law and enforce the rules. So I went into her room, I went marching in there and said, Lauren, you're two, you've gone four texts over, give me your phone, as we agreed, per the rules of the house. I don't know why she responded this way, but what I saw from her was, oh. <laughs> she started crying and she said, I don't know what I'm going to do, Dad, this is horrible, this is the worst day of my life, you know, the world's coming to an end. And I was a little bit shocked by that response because I thought, well, hey, you broke the rule. You give me the phone. What's the big deal? And I had a fantasy about how I would respond to that. To that. What I wanted to say but I didn't share it was, you know, Lauren, um, it's possible for you to use the landline in our house. You know how to use that, right? Um, and I also had a fantasy of saying to her something like, well, what part of 2004 don't you understand? But I didn't. Because this was back when we were developing our formula for compassionate conflict that I'm going to share with you later today. And I thought, well, here's a chance to try it. And so I did something different. I applied the formula by starting it open with her. And I empathized by sharing, you know, Lauren, I get it. It would be hard to lose your phone. And I understand how important this game is tonight and how important it is for you to be there and see your boyfriend play. I moved to resourcefulness then and offered to be a resource instead of rescuing her from the problem. And I said, you know, I'm willing to help you problem solve the situation. And then I went to persistence and I reinforced the non-negotiable, which was that she had to surrender her phone. And I ended by saying, I'm willing to be here to help problem solve with you, but I am going to take your phone. And then I went back to openness and I, re and I reflected back to her and I said, how are you feeling about that? She looked at me like she was stunned, like she didn't know what to do, and she did what any self-respecting teenager would do. She switched roles on the dreaded drama triangle. Instead of playing the victim like she had before, this time she switched over to the persecutor and she did this. Dad, you're the worst dad ever. No parents have such ridiculous rules. I, you haven't even talked to them. You have no idea what you're doing. This is crazy. And then she said the most damaging thing. She said, if my boyfriend breaks up with you tonight, that's on you. Whoo! I don't know about the rest of you, but I had some more fantasies about what I wanted to say then. And one of them started like this. I brought you into this world, and I can take you out. But I didn't say that. I also wanted to say, hey, you're lucky to even have a cell phone. I could delete your account with one press of my finger. Don't make me have to take away your phone forever. I also wanted to take away Christmas, but I didn't do that. But instead, I thought, let me practice that formula again, because positive conflict doesn't always work the first time, because people have to learn and realize that the rules are different, and that I wasn't going to throw her under the bus, but I also was going to hold her accountable in a spirit of dignity. So I did an open, resourceful, persistent another time, and it sounded like this. Gosh, Lauren, I remember what it was like. I got grounded once before prom, and it was horrible. So I get it. And like I said, I'm willing to problem solve with you ways to get by without your phone and get to the game tonight, but I am going to take your phone. How does that sit with you? 
And this time she did something that I'll never forget. And it's the reason that this story is in my book. She looked at me and her face dropped and she said, Dad, here's what's really going on. She said, when you came into my room, I was texting my friend Jessica and we were trying to decide who's going to wear the blue jeans to the game and who's going to wear the white jeans to the game. Because if we wear the same jeans, I will be mortified and feel so embarrassed at the game. I'm a dad of three daughters, so I get how important this is. Some people may think that I was crazy, but I thought, okay, I'll go with it. And I said, okay, honey, what, what do you want to do? And she said, dad, can I make one more text to Jessica and let her know I'm losing my phone? And that she can call me back on her home phone and we can finish our conversation and figure out who's going to wear which jeans to the game. Well, I had a choice to make. Do I lay down the law and say, absolutely not, 2004 is four too many? Or do I allow her to be part of the solution and problem solve the situation? So I said, yes, honey. You can make one more text. And I'm going to sit here with you, and then you can give me your phone when you're done. And she did exactly that. She texted her friend Jessica. She gave me the phone willingly. And as I left, she said, Dad, and I turned around and she came up to me and she gave me a hug and she said, Dad, I love you. Thank you so much. And she went back to her room, ostensibly to put on the blue jeans. I don't know. But when I left, I was overcome with emotion and I collapsed on the chair in our living room and started crying because of what had happened. I think the significance of that event is that I had been able to use a different approach. I was able to engage in conflict with my daughter hold her accountable for her behaviors. She stepped up and chose to be part of the solution. I was able to maintain boundaries and rules in the house, and we stayed connected as a daughter and a father. It was a beautiful day, and I've continued to use that formula, and our companies continue to evolve it. I'm going to end by sharing that formula in ways that we can use it in both personal and professional situations. I'm going to stop for a second because I'd, I'd like you to reflect on what you experienced as you heard that story. And if you care to respond, over the next few minutes as I'm sharing some other things, feel free to type into, your, into the comment section what was going through your mind or your heart as you heard that. Could you relate? Have you ever been in a situation where you knew conflict needed to happen, but every time you tried to do it, it turned out bad? Have you ever wished that you had a different way to walk into the fire with somebody instead of against them? Would love to hear what was going on with you. I want to do a self-awareness checklist because we talk a lot about drama. And I want to ask you a bunch of questions. And you can respond to yourself or if you're in a work group, maybe in your break room or, or wherever you are. Um, Kim, you and your team there at PRN. Um, feel free to raise your hands and let each other know how you would answer these questions. So here's the questions. Do you ever do things for people, even when they don't ask for help? Do you ever avoid asking for what you want when there's conflict? Do you ever lose patience when things don't go your way? Do you get frustrated with people that aren't as committed as you? Do you avoid sharing your feelings about a situation because you think it just won't matter or might just cause more problems? Do you give unsolicited advice to make other people better? Do you take negative feedback as a sign of personal rejection? Do you choose compromise to avoid conflict? Have you ever used fear, intimidation, or guilt to influence behavior Excuse me, and get people to do what you want? If you answered yes to any of these, you might be experiencing drama in your life. And you're not alone because you're just like everybody else on this webinar and you're just like me and my family. Would you like, uh, at the end of this webinar and as you apply these concepts, would you like to be able to do any of these things? Would you like to be able to confront performance problems head on in a spirit of dignity so we get to the real behavior? Would you like to deal with toxic employees in ways that actually solve the problem without creating new ones? Would you like to stop gossip dead in its tracks in the break room tomorrow? Would you like to lead change initiatives that are actually successful and follow, and follow through? Would you like to build healthy work cultures? Would you like to negotiate win-win solutions when there's conflict, differences, and disagreements? 
Would you like to bridge generational divides and get down to the real issues so that different generations can work together to solve problems? Would you like to lead up, down, or sideways on any given day? Would you like to be able to exert influence beyond your power or position to influence things in positive directions? Well, if you, if you said yes to any of these, then this webinar is for you. And Leading Out of Drama provides tools and strategies that can help you achieve these things. So, what is conflict? What is it anyways? Well, Ken Blanchard is one of my favorite authors and a wonderful, wonderful man. And his quote is that a problem only exists if there's a difference between what's actually happening and what you desire to be happening. What a wonderful definition of conflict. Because conflict is simply a gap. It's a tug of war between the two ends of a spectrum. Maybe it's a gap between what I want and what I'm getting. My middle daughter Emily wants a new car and she doesn't have one. There's conflict. It might be a gap between where we've been and where we're going. I'm working with my church now on trying to envision where we're going to be and what kind of a pastor we want to find for the next 10 or 15 years. There's a conflict. What if it's a gap between what's comfortable and what, what I need to know or what's next? And so now I have to learn new things in order to close that gap. Maybe it's the gap between what I know already and what I'm confident about and the new skills that I need to learn in order to be effective. It's daily occurrence these days. And I'll tell you, <laughs> Becky, since working with you, I've learned so many new things. It seems every day there's a new gap between what I know and the new things I need to learn to be more effective. And it's a wonderful thing. Because this conflict, this gap generates energy, pure and simple. If you've ever wanted something really bad, you know the energy and the effort that you're willing to expend to be able to close that gap between what you want and what you currently have. That energy has power, and so we have to be very careful about how that power is used. Because sometimes the energy can be spent on drama, and it literally sucks the life out of everything in its path. That's why I named my first book, Beyond Drama, Transcending Energy Vampires. It's all about understanding how the energy of drama just sucks the life out of us. Let's take a look at where drama and this negative energy and this negative conflict is wreaking havoc today. Just look at our current political situation and the way in which the negative conflict just seems to be escalating every day, every day. Globally, look at the, look at the conflict of terrorism, the conflict of strife, and the, um, all the different things going around the world where, we take, where we're taking the energy of that gap and that conflict and we're misusing it in ways that are so destructive and leave so many casualties behind. So I'm going to stop. Actually, before I'm going to go back here. Before I go forward, um, I'm curious, Becky, any comments uh, that people have shared about their reaction to that story with my daughter? You know, lots of reactions are coming through. Uh, Nate, uh, several people commending you on your approach with your daughter. A few people having questions about how to implement it with their own children. Um, people reflecting about the fact that um, your story was relatable, that it causes them to be compelled to think about times they wish they could respond differently. Uh, Joseph said he has two daughters and uh, fortunately has to use ORP, I'm not sure, maybe you know what that means, Nate, uh, to resolve drama with 16 and 22 year old daughters. So lots of uh, good thinking and reflection happening. Uh, thank you. Usually this is a very emotional story for me and I tell it, I've told it hundreds of times and every time um, I'm almost brought to tears when I remember that. I think without having an audience of actual people in front of me, I can't see your faces. But I'm sure if I could, and if I could see your reactions, we, we would be sharing that. And um, we could shed a tear together. Well, so the next question for you to ponder, and feel free again to comment, and I'll check in with Becky later about, about what you write, is what is your drama? You know, we all experience this negative conflict in different ways. And the second question is, what are the casualties? For some of us, it might be casualties um, in terms of our psychological health. Maybe we're feeling down. Maybe we're losing sleep. I know when I have more drama, I tend to not sleep as well because I'm preoccupied and I'm ruminating about things. Maybe you've experienced physical problems, emotional problems. Maybe relationships have been broken. Maybe you've lost a job or left a job because of drama. If you work in a company that's full of drama, what is that costing you in terms of time, 
energy, um, client relationships, uh, ability to get things done and achieve your goals. It turns out that in the U.S. in the U.S. alone, about 350 billion dollars is wasted on drama every year. The Gallup organization has tracked this by looking at time wasted, uh, absenteeism, morale problems, energy spent gossiping and having side conversations and distracted, um, and trying to get people on text to join you against your boss. Uh, these these things are very expensive, and in the U.S. economy, the cost is very very high. Uh, I can only imagine what it is globally. In our work with companies around the world and with individual leaders as well, we have found that there are some very top energy vampires. What are the most costly consequences of uh, drama in our companies? Well, the first one is gossip. And we define gossip as any time when two people are trying to join each other in drama against a third party. Lack of follow through. When there's drama, people don't speak up, they don't hold each other accountable, we don't say what we were going to say, we, we don't speak clearly about our commitments, and the consequence is very often the only result of a meeting is that we schedule the next meeting. Passive aggressive behavior is very, very costly. People don't speak up when they have the chance for a variety of legitimate reasons, but then later they try to get what they want in roundabout ways. Absenteeism and low engagement. Have you ever called in not sick, but called in sick of the people that you work with? Or have you come to work but been unable to focus and concentrate because of all the drama that's around you or the drama that you're involved in with somebody? What about resisting change and innovation? Maybe we comply with change efforts, but we're not really invested and we're not engaged, and so it doesn't happen like it's supposed to. Damage relationships of all types. Unproductive meetings. Like I said before, when you get people together in a room, it's very expensive. Their time, their energy, their knowledge. And so if those meetings are fraught with drama, uh, it can be a very expensive waste of time and energy and resources for an organization. In fact, one of, uh, one of the curriculums that we uh, have, have developed is specifically for how to apply these, these principles of healthy conflict to meetings so that when you get people together, things get done, people feel engaged, and it's a safe environment for curious exploration of the things that we're going to commit to to be successful going forward. If you have any other top energy vampires in your life, feel free to write, type those in, and Becky will share a few of them later. I want to share with you a model for understanding what goes on when there's negative conflict, and it's called the drama triangle. Many of you maybe have heard of it. It's a very popular model that's been around since the 1970s, developed by a psychiatrist by the name of Stephen Cartman. And he identified that when people get sideways with one another and we get into this negative conflict, they play one of three very predictable roles. And I want to emphasize that these, what I'm going to share here are roles. These are not identity. Uh, we all have lots of roles. I'm a father. I'm a son. Uh, I'm a CEO. I'm a friend. Each one of those roles has certain expectations, certain uh, predictable behaviors, and certain habits and patterns that we develop. No one of those is who I am, but they're all kind of faces that I, that I, uh, characters that I take on depending on the situation. So here are three unhealthy characters that we can play in any given day when we're in drama. The first role is the role of the persecutor. And the persecutor adopts this attitude that, hey, I'm fine, you're the one with the problem, it's your fault. If you weren't so lazy, stupid, and uncommitted, we wouldn't have all these problems. And so they might say something like, man, you blew it and jeopardized our position. What kind of a loser are you? Sometimes the comments could be more subtle, and they don't even have to have a lot of emotion. Like uh, perhaps something like this, don't make me have to fire you. The general uh, feeling of the persecutor is that, hey, because I'm okay and you're not, Therefore, it is okay for me to criticize you, ridicule you, withhold information, use fear, intimidation, and guilt to get you to do what I want. The second role, in no particular order, is the role of the victim. Now, the victim adopts just the opposite, but a very complementary attitude to the persecutor. They adopt the attitude that, hey, you're fine. I'm the one with the problem. I'm not okay. It's probably my fault. I'm the bad person. 
if you've ever been rushing home from work and you tried to hit the grocery store and you're going too fast and you come flying out of the end of the aisle and hit somebody with your grocery cart and they apologize, you probably just met a victim. The victim might say something like, okay, whatever everybody else wants to do is fine. They give in, they put their needs on the back burner, and they basically assume that who they are and what they want is not that important. Now, when the persecutor and the victim are going at it in this kind of codependent, uh, dysfunctional way, we got to have the rescuer. This is the third role in the drama triangle. And the rescuer loves to make their living and get their, get their ego stoked by fixing everyone else's problems except for their own. So they're masters of noticing need and going in there and having perfect solutions and wonderful advice. And they do so from this emotional distance where, um, you know, you'd be okay if you take my advice. I'm fine. And so their belief basically is, I'm okay and you would be okay if you would let me fix you. Rescuers might say something like, here, why don't you do it my way? Or here, I've got a perfect solution to your problem. So what happens when these roles are being played out in a work culture, a church culture, a family culture? What do cultures of drama? And I should let you know, when, with this model in our frame of mind, it's very easy to visit with a company or a potential client, and as they describe their culture, we can start seeing these roles playing themselves out. Persecutor cultures generally are epitomized by fear, intimidation, and blame. That seems to be the modus operandi and the rules of engagement for how to get what you want. When victims are in charge, or cultures of drama where there's victim leadership, we tend to have passive compliance, where the rules, the unwritten rules of engagement are, hey, don't rock the boat, do whatever they say, just don't make anybody angry. When rescuers are in charge, we tend to have um, over-dependence and uh, because the rescuer is keen on building dependence by fixing everybody and making them dependent on them. So we have a lot of over-functioning, a lot of the Peter principle, where people are, are um, elevated to a position beyond their level of competence, and all they know how to do is show everyone else how to do what they used to do, instead of helping empower people and building competence. So I hope that this may help you do a quick diagnosis of your culture and see which roles may be more active and more lively. I'd like to stop right now and um, <clears throat> see, uh, uh, Becky, what have you seen coming through about uh, what I shared before? Just one second, Nate. I, I think you caught me off guard. I thought you were going to ask people to say which of these roles they take more often. I want um, to, and I didn't share with you that I want to do that next, but uh, uh, if you I got it. just yeah, a few. No, I, I'd be happy to. So I, I see a comment that someone in the past left a, a job because of drama. So uh, when you were talking about the different costs of drama, um, we're seeing that here. Um, and then, um, sorry about that. Um, I have a really interesting comment here also from Lynn and, and one that resonates with me deeply. She's talking about how conflicts can generate energy, but it can also sap energy and, it, and how it impacts an individual is probably related to the fight or flight mechanism. So I thought that was a really interesting observation because I, I find that obviously some drama in my life or conflict does drain me of energy. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting because we tend to see the persecutor wanting to fight and the victim wanting to flight. And then the rescuer likes to stoke the fire of fight and flight. And they get it all going. <laughs> interesting. Um, I did have a question from someone come through saying that the person is a rescuer and how can I change this? Perhaps that's going to be covered later. Well, I'm so glad. That is a perfect segue. Thank you for that question. As we move on, I'm going to invite you now to reflect on and share uh, with, with, in the comments, which role do you play more often? And a lot of people say, well, it depends on the situation. I might play one or two, or I see myself in all three positions from time to time. If you'd be willing to uh, pick a, a situation in your life and uh, identify which role is most typical for you, and will you type that in there? And Becky's going to pay attention to what patterns and trends evolve and share with us later what, uh, what she sees. 
Well, here's our definition of drama, and then we're going to move forward and start looking at healthy, positive solutions for the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes, and then um, get into some Q&A. We define drama as using the energy of conflict to struggle against ourselves or other people with or without awareness to feel justified about our healthy behaviors. Three really important features here. The first one has to do with this notion of struggling against. It's a win-lose situation. Second of all, we may not be aware of it. This may be patterns that we learned throughout our whole lives and we've been doing them so often and so uh, frequently uh, that we don't even know we're doing it. Finally, the modus operandi or ultimate motive when we're in drama is to feel justified. The goal is not to be effective or to find win-win solutions. The goal is to be able to go to bed at night and say, see, I was right. But there's a better way. And so uh, thank you to that question. Let's take a look at what can we do and what are some antidotes to drama so we can take that energy and reuse it and repurpose it to create amazing things. If drama is to struggle against, then let's look at this alternative, which is what we call compassion. I've done some research on the word compassion, and we've discovered that it comes from the Latin root that means to struggle with. Calm means alongside or with, and passion means to suffer or to struggle. Notice here that when we, when we compare these two definitions, the word struggle is the same. So compassion is not about getting rid of conflict. It's about changing the struggle. There are three alternatives, healthy skills that we can develop that help us combat drama. And we have, uh, we've laid these in our Next Elements Compassion Cycle, which is our framework for moving forward with positive conflict to turn the energy of differences and disagreements into a creative force. The first skill is the skill of openness. Openness is about transparency, about courage to be who you are, and to believe enough in yourself that you're willing to let other people see it without expecting or needing to know that they're going to treat you a particular way. I believe that true trust has to do with knowing that I am okay regardless of how you respond to me. The mantra of the open person is, I will be transparent with you and I will not judge or share. I will not judge what you share with me. So as much as I'm willing to be transparent, I'm also willing to invite you to do that and um, guarantee you that it will not backfire against you. Resourcefulness is the second compassion skill. <clears throat> Excuse me. Resourcefulness is about creative problem solving. It's about leveraging gifts. And instead of giving a person a fish, it's about teaching them how to fish. And not only that, but helping them learn how to fish using the resources that they have available to them and in a way that works well with them so that they could be successful. The mantra of resourcefulness is, I'm willing to uh, provide resources and help you, but I'm not willing to do it for you. The alternative to, uh, the, the third skill is persistence. And persistence is about stick to itiveness It's about the courage and the guts and the grit to work hard, keep putting one foot in front of the other each day, and to keep getting up and keep moving forward even when the going gets tough, or it's not fun, or it's boring. The mantra of the persistent person is, I will hold myself accountable, and others as well, but I won't attack or blame them. And I think sometimes we think that holding people accountable means that sometimes you just have to bring the hammer down or you have to show them who's boss or I'm going to bring them in here and um, you know, rip, them, rip them a new one to teach them that they need to do what they're supposed to do. That couldn't be further from the truth. That's persecuting. And so one thing I want to emphasize is that each one of these is the healthy antidote to its drama counterpart. People that are highly open have a tendency to be a victim when they're in distress. Consequently, openness is the antidote to victim. The same is true for the other two. What happens when leaders begin to epitomize these skills and live out these skills in the culture? Well, when we're practicing openness as a leader, we are sending a message to ourselves and to everyone around us that we are worthwhile, that we are worth investing in, that our feelings and our wants and our needs are worthwhile. When we're practicing resourcefulness, we are sending a message to ourselves and to the world. We are capable. Every employee, every child, every spouse, every friend wants to know that you believe they're capable and that you believe that they can learn things and that together we can be effective in achieving goals. 
When leaders practice persistence, they send the message that we are accountable. It means that we say what we, we do what we say. We follow through on our promises. And when we have a mission statement written on the wall, we live that mission statement in all aspects of our lives. So if we get back to culture, what do high-performing organizational cultures look like? When we've worked with cultures that are working really, really well, or ones that are using our principles to develop more, more uh, compassionate accountability, what starts to happen is the cultures have three very important qualities. First of all, they're safe. People feel safe to share what's on their mind, to share their ideas and their feelings and their wants without fear of incrimination. They know that they're going to be taken seriously. Curiosity is the second ingredient, because curious cultures mean that we actually want to know the answer when we ask you a question. When we have a suggestion box, we actually read what's in there. When we ask for feedback, we share with you what we've learned. And when I ask a question, I don't ask closed-ended questions like, are you going to wear that again? I ask open-ended questions like, what are you going to wear today? The third quality is consistency. Consistency means that we can count on doing what we say, saying what we mean, and following through on our promises. All three of these are critical. They're all necessary, but not sufficient by themselves for the highest performing organization, for the best functioning leader, and for the best relationship between a father and a daughter. One of my mentors and uh, heroes, personal heroes, is Michael Mead. He's a mythologist, a poet, and a drummer, a musician. He works with inner city youth and tribal cultures in Africa. And he, is, he has said that the purpose of conflict is to create. What a wonderful promise. What a wonderful opportunity when conflict comes knocking. Because if we look at two ends of a spectrum, if we practice compassion without accountability, it gets us nowhere. We can't reach some of our biggest goals by just being nice to everybody. Alternatively, if we practice accountability without compassion, it'll get us alienated. I know those people that get everything done, and they're always meeting their targets, and they're a bear to be around, and everybody hates them because they're so mean. The goal is to blend the two. And that truly is the art of leadership and the art of wonderful relationships where compassion and accountability are balanced. Let's take a look at how it works and get down to some, some specifics about how we would apply this thing. Well, first of all, if we practice openness, we're sending a message that we are creating a safe place where we can share our most important agendas, motives, and feelings. And when those real issues are out on the table, then we can move, move to resourcefulness and we can work on problem solving, creatively problem solving the most important things so that the best ideas get out there and we, and we are able to find solutions that are dealing with the most important problems. Persistence then breeds confidence that we're going to say what we do, we're going to follow through on our promises, and that when we make commitments and we choose options from resourcefulness, we're actually going to do them. Here's what we've discovered. Order matters. When it comes time to hold people accountable, including ourselves, in a spirit of compassion, it matters where we start and it matters where we end. In fact, we've discovered that it is most important to start with openness, move to resourcefulness, go to persistence, and then come back to openness. That's the principle that I practice with my daughter, and it's the principle behind our formula for compassionate accountability. When drama comes knocking, the formula for compassionate accountability is a very effective way to respond. And the way it, res the way it works is that we craft a response to the drama that includes first open, then resourceful, then persistent, and then back to open. Generally at Open, we share our feelings and motives. At Resourceful, we talk about what resources are available and what we're willing to do to solve the problem. At Persistent, we get crystal clear about non-negotiables and principles that are at stake. And then at, at Open, we come back and, and show that we're actually connected to this person and that we care about them and that we don't mean any harm. Let's see what it looks like in practice. But before I go any further, I'd like to check back in with Becky and see what people have submitted uh, with regards to what is their most likely drama role. Sure. So, Nate, just as we discussed, I tried to tick off what I saw coming in, and by far we have a lot of rescuers on this call. Um, I would say um, 
of the, the majority uh, who gave one role over another selected rescuer as their role. We had a few people say that they operate in the victim role and only one brave soul admitted to being a persecutor. Well, I am really proud of you for admitting that because um, we all do this and it's not a surprise that rescuer was the highest. Uh, in fact, rescuer role is, is probably the most um, culturally allowed and even encouraged role in a lot of our work cultures. Um, and um, I want to speak a little bit more about that in the follow-up webinar where we go deep into how drama manifests itself in cultures and how we know that we're getting to this brink of, of extinction uh, when we practice some of these roles too much. But definitely rescuer is very, very common and um, particularly in healthcare settings and in nonprofits and in middle management. Nate, I heard from a couple of people who said they're in HR roles and that in the HR role that's the expected role to take on of, of rescuing. Oh yeah, we fix everyone's problems and we play buffer for upper management and then we take it take one for the team. Um, so it's it's uh, we recently uh, obtained about seventy five people completed our drama resilience assessment at a recent HR conference and we looked at the aggregate of the results and uh, true to form rescuers by far the highest among the HR professionals yeah that's helpful insight yeah although I did have another person just now admit to being a persecutor so way to go hey we're starting a persecutor support group because that's my favorite role and amazingly I actually do it inside my head more than anything I do most of my really good persecuting when I'm mowing the lawn, when nobody can hear it. Interesting. Let's take a look at how this formula can be applied in some real life situations. Let's say that I'm a leader or a supervisor and we're going through some really scary change in our company. And someone has come to me and they're really freaking out. They, they don't know what's going on, they want answers, and um, they have just kind of un unloaded or downloaded on me, and this is my first response. Let's say that they came in and showed me the victim role and said something like, oh my goodness, I don't know what to do, I don't know what's going on, nobody ever tells me anything, I'm probably going to get fired. Here's the first thing that I might say as a supervisor in that situation. And note that I'm going to start with open, go to resourceful, go to persistent, and end back at open, applying the formula. Boy, I can appreciate how scary this is. I remember worrying about my job during our merger in 06. What information can I provide that will help you? I'm committed to being transparent. I care about how you're doing. Now, in this situation, I haven't shared any information, really. I haven't tried to solve their problem for them. But what I have done is I've empathized. I've offered to be a resource. I've set clear boundaries about what I'm willing to do for them. And I've told them that I care. Now, we might be able to go on and have a very productive conversation, or they may not respond and I may need to do the formula again and again. Let's look at what happens in the fractured team. Let's say that I'm a team leader and I'm a new team leader and I really don't feel like I've been doing a good job bringing my team together. And in fact, I might be making things worse. And I'm willing to bring it up with the team and ask for their help. So I might start by saying, I feel really confused about the reactions I got from the team yesterday. I want us to be aligned. I'm open to receiving and acting on any feedback that you share with me. I promise to make changes to improve our teamwork. Where are you at with this? Again, disclosing how I'm feeling, gathering information at Resourceful, making a commitment about um, what I'm willing to do at Persistent, and then checking back in with the team and often with myself at Open again. Let's take a fourth example. This one's a hard one because it's about, I don't know if that was the, I think it was the third example, but it's uh, numbered number four. So for those of you that are keeping track, I feel your pain. You can rescue me and send me a message about how I could fix it. Um, let's say we got to let somebody go. And this is a very difficult situation. How do we deliver really bad news and really tough news in a spirit of compassionate accountability? It might go something like this. I can imagine you've been worrying about this all day. It's awkward. And I'm, I've got to move something to see here. So I'm moving my control panel. Um, we're downsizing by 10% and I've decided to let you go. I'm willing to share my reasons if you want to know. 
My decision is final, and I'm committed to helping you find the best possible exit plan. I'm anxious about doing this because I care about you. Those of you in HR, this may seem pretty scary to be this vulnerable and this open, but notice that in number one, I empathize with how difficult it must be. In number two, I share the relevant information and, I'm, and I offer myself as a resource without giving too much information. I don't need to over explain. At three, I get clear about what's negotiable and what isn't and I make a promise to help them. And then at number four, I disclose how I'm feeling and I again show them that I do care. This was a, uh, I'm going to go back to this one. This is actually a very relevant situation and I want to finish with a, with a quick story. Um, about a year ago, I helped a nurse manager fire four people in the same afternoon using this formula. We were working with this company and I got a call in the morning that said, from this nurse manager saying, I need some help. Uh, I gotta, I'm, I've been given a list by executive management of, that I have to downsize my department by 10% and there's four people that I have to fire. I didn't get to decide who they were, and I have to have them fired by 5 o'clock this afternoon. Will you help me? So I came in and we started working on how to prepare for this difficult conversation. And what we did first is we, we, we looked at the four people she was going to be firing. We collected all of the possible things that she could say at open. What feelings was she having that she'd be willing to share? Uh, in what ways could she empathize? Uh, is there anything she could do to relate to the situation that they were in? At Resourcefulness, we talked about what resources does she have to offer them? What options are she, is she going to give them after the, after the fire? Um, is there any information she wants from them, and what would that be? At Persistence, we got crystal clear about the one or two non-negotiables. The first one is that they were going to get fired. This, and the second one for her was that that decision is final, and it's my decision. And then back at, um, at the, the remaining O, uh, we talked about are there any other ways that she could reach out and share with, share with them that she does care about them as a person. It was an excruciating afternoon. She did fire all four of them. And I was there um, kind of sitting on the side. And the, each employee knew that I was there and knew my purpose. And it wasn't pretty. Uh, some of them went into drama immediately and stayed in drama like my daughter did for a while. One lady was afraid of losing her insurance, and her husband had cancer, and she didn't know what she would do without a job. Another one turned on the nurse manager and attacked her for playing favorites and, hire, and firing the worst people and doing all these things. Each time she stuck to her guns, each time she repeated the cycle of ORPO, ORPO, and each time she, she completed the firing. And uh, it was a very difficult afternoon. I found out later that she quit the next day because she was not going to work for a place like this. And um, an interesting story she told me is she met one of those nurses that she had fired about a month later at the grocery store. And that nurse came up to her and gave her a hug and said, thank you so much because I know that you were acting on your orders and you preserved my dignity even though you did a very difficult thing. And I just couldn't hate you. And I thought, what an interesting example of how this can happen in a work setting, just like it happened with my daughter. As I'm wrapping up, I want to share a few things about what's coming up in the next webinars, and then leave a good 10 minutes for questions and answer. But I want to ask you to reflect on what opportunities do you see? Where could compassion accountability work in your life? Where would you like to apply the formula for compassionate conflict and the skills of openness, mm -hmm resourcefulness and persistence to be able to combat drama and turn that negative energy into something amazing. Instead of being an energy vampire, you could be a maven of compassionate accountability. I want to come back to the offer that, uh, that uh, Becky mentioned, and thanks for everyone that is here uh, at the end of this webinar. What I want to invite you to do is uh, buy our book. We're making a big push this month, and we're very excited to sell our book, Conflict Without Casualties. And like Becky mentioned, uh, it is a limited edition because it will be published by Barrett Kohler Publishers next year as a paperback version. So if you get the ones that we have now, they're very nice <coughs> hard copy editions. They're very um, And when you buy the book, in the back of the book will be a code for you to take the Drama Resilience Assessment. And you'll be able to get your own scores so you can find out what is your drama risks and what are your compassion potentials. And then you'll get an invitation. Well, everyone will get an invitation to join an advanced seminar 
where you can bring your results, you can bring questions that you have from looking at the book, and we're going to dive a lot deeper into interpreting what your scores mean for you, and we're going to talk a lot about how this applies to cultures, to building cultures of compassion and accountability, and continue to answer some of your deeper questions about how this can apply to your life. The times for the upcoming seminars are over on the right there, November 11 at 10 a.m. Central, and again in November 29 at noon. And we will be sending a follow-up email uh, that will have those times again uh, listed for you. I'm going to go to the last slide here and invite you to connect with us. We, we love to be connected. We love to, to add you to our mailing list so you can get my blog where I publish articles twice a week on practicing compassionate accountability in leadership and life. I'm going to stop here and turn it over to Becky for what, or for all of you, for what questions you might have and uh, any additional things that have come in on the comments. Sure thing. There are several questions that have come in. Um, I have a question here from Dwight, um, Nate, and he's wondering how you avoid the tendency when you're at that resourcefulness part to defer the decision to those above you. So basically, you know, you're in that moment and like you're just deferring to someone else and not, not staying present with, with the cycle. So that is a great question. And one of the answer probably comes just ahead in the, uh, in the persistent part. If I have contemplated the persistent part of the equation, I've gotten clear about what's my responsibility, what is the employee's responsibility, and what is my boss's responsibility. And so that way I know what part of the problem is here for me, what is for them. Uh, one of the things that's very difficult for people that tend to rescue is not is either to avoid delegating, which means here I'll just solve it or here's a question. Um, or to not delegate appropriately and not be able to get crystal clear about this is the part of the problem that is for you to solve, this is the part that's for me to solve. The best rule that I like to give to rescuers is uh, simply ask, for, ask permission before you help and make yourself a resource by sharing what you're willing to do and what you're willing to offer without pushing it on people. Wow, that's a really good point. And so if you see me looking down, it's because I'm furiously scribbling that down. Ask for permission before you offer help. That is fantastic. Um, so I had a comment earlier um, from someone who mentioned um, some trouble at a temp job where she was recently serving, and there was a lot of drama because people wanted to one-up each other, and people were so busy stroking their own egos that no work was getting done. And she said that she realizes people have to do that, but it gets in the way of getting work accomplished. And don't you agree? So um, I want to ask another question beyond don't you agree. What might you recommend for the person who's sharing this, this struggle? Thank you. That's, boy, that's a common thing. And particularly in those types of job situations, everybody seems to be jockeying for these power plays. And maybe they're not together for very long in a temporary situation, so they kind of hit it pretty hard. Uh, trying to uh, boost their egos. I think the first thing to recognize is that energy is being spent to stroke egos, like you said, not to get the work done. So if it is your commitment to be an effective employee and do a good job, then um, you have the opportunity to engage in compassionate conflict with those people. And it's not to change them. It's to get clear about how you're going to participate. Maybe it would sound something like this. O -O -R -P -O open, resourceful, persistent, uh, uh, open, I might say, you know, I feel very uncomfortable with this conversation because I want to focus on my work. And when you're talking about these things, I can't work. I would prefer that you don't talk to me about these things and let me do my job. How does that sound to you? Now, will it fix it? Probably not. Might you have to go around a couple times before they take you seriously? Absolutely. Because compassionate conflict means we're changing the rules of the game. And just like a child who gets told no for candy at the checkout counter for the first time after a year, they're not going to believe you until they know you mean it. Got it. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you would have any encouragement for a listener who wrote in about being in, in an awful position with family where there's a persecutor and she's in the victim role and there's no rescuer yet, but it's clear who it would be. Uh, what might you say to encourage uh, this listener today? Thank you. It's a tough situation, and with family, we can't just fire them, and we can't just avoid them, and we can't just kick them out of our house. And so, uh, very often, how do we coexist in the most respectful way? 
Um, and you're very astute because when there, nature hates a vacuum, and so if there are two roles going at it, we are very motivated to recruit that third role to come kind of play their part and ease the tension so that things kind of work in this, in this uh, co codependent way. Reassurance I can give you is if, if you muster the courage to practice this formula and if you get crystal clear about what you want and what your boundaries are and you do that in a respectful way, more often than not, per persecutors will actually respect that. Because persecutors tend to go for blood when they sense weakness or when they sense that you don't stand for anything or when they sense that you're not committed. And if you're playing the victim role in response to that, all it does is reinforce that you can't be trusted. And so I, paradoxically, when people uh, set a firm boundary, um, very often the persecutor will actually respect them. Now I should say, I want to be crystal clear that this is not an intervention if there is domestic violence or if there is a perpetrator that really wants to hurt you physically or psychologically. Um, in that situation, it's much more important to make sure that you stay safe and not attempt positive conflict that really could make things worse. That's a helpful clarification. So a follow-up question is, uh, Nate, if you find yourself in a victim role and your feelings are incredibly hurt, how do you not use flight? So I hear you saying, Nate, that we have to stay persistent, stay in that openness, resourcefulness, uh, persistent cycle. So how do you not just want to run away when you're in the victim position? Well, it's possible to want to run away and still not. And uh, no, nobody is, uh, there's, by no means am I promising this is going to be easy. A lot of people say, great, if we practice all these things, life's going to be easy, right? And I said, well, you might have forgotten the definition of compassion, which means to struggle with. It's going to be hard, and it's going to take a lot of courage. The, um, the um, encouragement I might offer is that, first of all, to be aware that my feelings are mine, and they don't belong to anybody. Nobody can hurt me. Nobody can disrespect me. Nobody can attack me. I can choose how I feel. And so instead of saying, I feel hurt, perhaps we can say, I feel afraid, or I feel defensive, or actually tell the person, I want to run away right now, but I'm choosing to stay because I want to be part of the solution. The other thing to recognize is that the formula needs all four O-R-P-O to work together. Simply contemplating being honest and starting at O is incredibly scary if we don't also have the R and the P to go with it. And so one of the things I recommend is if you're contemplating trying this with someone and you're scared, practice writing it out. Practice saying it in the mirror. Practice saying it over and over and over. And one of the offers that I make to everybody that hears me speak is if you want to try an ORPO, you can email me. And for no strings attached and no cost, I'll go back and forth with you on email until I feel good about it, until you feel good about it, before you ever share it with anyone. Wow, that's a really powerful offer, Nate. Um, and I imagine that there are some people listening today who will take advantage of that offer. Thank you. I hope you do. My email is on the screen. I see it. Nate, could we go back just for one minute to the screen before? As we wrap up the hour together, I want to remind everyone of the very special offer that you made for these advanced learning sessions for free. There are two identical sessions on November 11th and November 29th, so when I send that follow-up email out, people can choose to register for one or the other. And for that session to be the most powerful, the most important thing you can do is go to next-element.com, purchase a limited edition hardcover a copy of Conflict Without Casualties. Look for the code in the back, back that will allow you to take the drama resilience assessment for free and do that prior to one of those sessions that you can return to for further learning with Nate. I think I got all that covered. Is that right? Um, oh, right. and Patrick, is there a promo code at all uh, associated with the purchase of the book today, Nate? Sorry to spring that on you. I know that you have some specials going this month for bulk purchase copies of the book. Bulk no, we do purchases. not. We do not have a promo code for individual purchases, but we do have package deals, and we do have a significant discount if you buy 25 or more. And so, if you're thinking this might be good for your team, or you want to get Christmas presents early, it's a fantastic time. And also know that that code in the back allows you to complete our assessment and get your results immediately, along with our self-guided course called Conflict in You, which is a $25 value if you purchase it separately. So it really is a great deal to buy the books, these limited edition copies of the book. 
Got it. So just out of curiosity, Nate, will the Drama Resilience Assessment be in the paperback editions that are coming? And I remember the date for those of you who want to mark your calendar. The paperback edition is coming April 24th. Um, but I, of course, encourage you to get the hardback edition today. Yes, the answer is yes. You w there will be the opportunity to receive the assessment. Uh, it will not include the self-guided course, though. It will be just the assessment. So this is why I was uh, encouraging people to get it now, because you more for your uh, code than you will in the future. Fantastic. Nate, could you give us some final thoughts before we wrap this hour together? Yeah. First of all, thank you for everyone that, that joined in. It's wonderful to feel that energy around the world. And I would just like to say I, I believe that uh, the misuse of conflict might be the biggest energy crisis facing our world. It might be more important than any of the other energy crises. If we can figure out how to take the energy that is generated by differences and disagreements, and instead of turning that into drama, if we can turn that into creative, compassionate accountability, we can accomplish amazing things. And I think we can change the world one person at a time, one interaction at a time. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.